I'm Bob Ward, architect from the Azure Data Team. You saw me in the dream sequence. I'm still not in a dream, I promise you. Uh, I know that you saw in the keynote some aspects of SQL Server 2022 that may have interest to you that involve connecting to Azure. My intention today in this session, in the next 15 minutes, is to dive deeper into these flybys that you saw like in the keynote. But quick mea culpa, it's like 50 minute session. When I did this session at the past summit online last year, it was 75 minutes. So I've cut some of the content that I did back then, but that's okay, because what I really want to focus on is just to show you a couple things. One, what are the three big things we're really doing to connect SQL Server 2022 to Azure? Why do you even want to consider this? Like, why do we do this? More importantly, how does it work? How about some architecture a little bit, and then some demos <clears throat> that are deeper than what you saw in the keynote, including a demo that I've never shown before on, on Purview. The full deck of what I've done in the past that was available on this site in the form of a PDF, we're still in private preview, so even the demos that I did, I actually recorded these. I'll stop and pause through them to show you a little bit. They're still not available online. That will all become available when we go public preview. I should also tell you, though, that the experiences you're going to see could slightly change. Again, we're still in private preview. We're still trying to working through what is the right user experience. Are there some limitations we're trying to kind of figure out? In addition, we still haven't decided and announced, which we do, would do a general availability, What's the pricing for this? Or what's the special way that I would get subscriptions for some of these Azure connected uh, features? And there are, other, are there other aspects like what's in standard, what's in enterprise? We never make those announcements until general availability. So we, wouldn't, we won't do that until in this same release. It'll be just the same way. So with that said, let me dive into this content. I will also tell you that I just love questions. I mean, I love people asking me anything they want about SQL Server. Though somebody asked me some bizarre question about hockey earlier, which I'm happy to talk about as well. But if we don't have time at the end, I'm going to deeply apologize ahead of time, but I'm so accessible. I'll stay here outside, talk to you all day long about this. Those online, it's bobward at microsoft.com. I won't be your personal support engineer, but I love talking about this, and I'll, I'll do it anytime you want to. And in addition, I'll stay afterwards. I'll be at the booth, and all day tomorrow I'm here at, at this event. Okay, so you may have some definitions of hybrid, like hybrid data platform, but I broke it down into two things for me personally. One is, do you have a product or service that's offered, offered both on-premises or in a public cloud with some consistency? I add that consistency part because you probably could offer a product and service in two different areas and they are totally different. And sure, there's differences between Azure SQL Database, Managed Instance, and SQL Server on-premises, but there, as you admit, there's a lot of consistency. But what's more interesting is, is that do you provide a product on-premises that connects to a cloud to enhance something? In the past, we've connected SQL Server to like Azure Blob Storage for backups, which is lovely and interesting, right? But is that really giving you some enhanced capability different than what I'm going to show you today? So just as a review, what I showed you is what I call my wheel of power. I did that in my intro session for SQL 2022. I'm going to focus only today in that top section and those three specific areas. Managed instance, Synapse, and Purview. We're going to look exactly what did we build, what does it kind of look like today, how does it work, and then spend more time looking at a demonstration and pausing and telling you how these things work uh, behind the scenes. So I kind of built this, though, different slide to show you with the dashed line meaning the cloud and SQL Server sitting on premises. But note this, uh, that SQL Server 2022 sitting underneath the dashed line could actually be an Azure virtual machine, by the way. So it could actually be technically right in the cloud as an IaaS or virtual machine. But let's talk more just assuming the fact that it's more of an on-premises environment. So what are the major areas we're doing? And then we'll, we'll dive into three of them. So first of all, we're taking Azure SQL Managed Instance and we're replicating data using distributed availability groups and allowing you to have, notice the two arrows, a bi-directional failover partnership, just like you might have that today with SQL Server. Second, we're going to take data. First of all, we're going to synchronize it. Then we're going to take changes, harvest those from your transaction log, and push those into Azure Synapse Analytics so that you can offload reporting from your SQL Server and do that more in SQL pools and analytics. Notice in Purview, there's a bi-directional process here this time. You notice in, in Synapse, it's just a one-way piece. Technically, it's two-way because we're sending some commands down to SQL, which I'll talk about in the architecture. But the data itself is only going one way to the cloud. For Purview, we actually have the ability to go down to your SQL Server and discover things like schemas. But we also, you're going to see in this demonstration, we're going to be able to push a, what's called a policy to your SQL Server to give certain individuals certain access rights for things that you want to see, like performance monitoring. Now, what we're not going to dive into today, but just to make sure you're aware of, we're supporting Azure Active Directory authentication, which, by the way, is required to use this something called Purview Policy Management, because these policies are based on AAD accounts. 
That might be a lucrative option as well for somebody in virtual machines for Azure, because if you don't want a pop-up domain controller, you could potentially get non-SQL or integrated off using AAD inside the cloud. Then finally, uh, what I don't also discuss today, but you see that already right in services for Azure SQL is Microsoft Defender for SQL. If you want to go back and look at recordings, I did an interesting demonstration yesterday in a developer session where I showed you how to do, do SQL injections in your code. <laughs> Probably don't want to do that, you want to prevent them, but I showed you how to do SQL injections where I was just dropping tables by embedding strings in user input. And Microsoft Defender for SQL is a good example of something that can detect those and alert you that that might be happening in your SQL environment. So let's focus on the three on the left. Let's do that for the rest of this uh, conversation, this discussion. You saw this, a little bit of this in the keynote with only the line about challenge, difficult to set up and maintain a DR site. You didn't see these details to the left here, but you saw this picture. So let's talk a little bit about what we're doing here, and then let's dive in more, make sure we totally understand what does it mean to be a distributed availability group, and then what are we doing with the technology? So, what it comes down to this is that it's actually the managed instance team that came to us in the SQL Server team quite a, quite a while back a little bit and come up with the idea that, you know, managed instance is really a SQL Server. You happen to have this technology called AGs <laughs> and distributed AGs. We think we could kind of leverage that because we're a SQL Server. Maybe we could set up SQL Server to be that DR site that sometimes people struggle with. Um, I have plenty of customer stories, maybe you do as well, or somebody has told me, you know, I'm actually back in the day visiting a customer and they're like, hey, can you give us some advice? Somebody set up our disaster recovery site and they left yesterday. And there's no instructions, no manual, no nothing. We have no idea what they did. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of a problem, right? So what if you could do that with managed instance? Maybe there's still some things that you've got to document or take care of, but what if on the, on the DR side, it's a managed service now? So it's automatically backed up, the infrastructure is managed for you, all those kind of things that managed instance provides. So let's talk a little bit more about it. First of all, if you've not seen this technology called distributed availability groups, notice in the diagram here, the concept that we had in the day in SQL 16 was, you've got an AG, you'd like to set up another AG in a distributed site somewhere, probably not located with you, right? Can I set up an asynchronous process between the AGs so I can distribute my changes to another one and use that for disaster recovery? So we built it into SQL Server itself you know, to, through T-SQL commands, and it, can, it actually can be sync or async, but most customers I've seen use this with async because the other AG is not you know, collated. So this is not an auto failover system, right? It is a manual failover, but it is a DR site. And notice in the case of the secondary that it also has an AG itself. So technically you could use that for read replica type scenarios, right? So primary, it's the local secondary and remote primary kind of at the same time. But the last bullet point, I mean, it's fair to criticize us here. I mean, it's not easy to set up. It's hard to configure. It's hard to maintain. So the adoption's been okay, but some customers have complained about that last bullet point. This is not a thing to kind of easily do or configure with SQL Server. So what we're doing with managed instances is we're going to take advantage of the combination of that technology in the engine. We're literally not going to make any changes to the engine to make this work. We're going to take advantage of that engine technology we're going to add some capabilities to managed instance, though, to make this all possible. Now, notice in this diagram right here that I show you behind the scenes here that the managed instance could be read-only. So it works with an existing AG, or we'll build one for you. You're like, what do you mean build one for us? We're actually technically going to build a local AG, and you're going to see in this demo, it doesn't have to actually have a replica in your environment to make this work. So we'll build an AG, we'll build a distributed AG, and everything's going to come with these two services, with SQL Server and with Managed Instance. I showed you quickly in the keynote, which is, keynotes are all about that, by the way, guys. You, you know, you're doing a bunch of them, so you're just kind of flying through something that you kind of say, like, I think I saw what Bob was doing, so we're going to spend more time looking at it. And here's the interesting part now that we've got set up. So the Managed Instance team has a link feature for Managed Instance. I'm going to describe this. <laughs> so previous versions of SQL Server will support it as a migration vehicle. You'll, you'll, you'll use this technology, connect a managed instance, you can then read from your managed instance and then migrate when you want. For SQL Server 2022, the intention is you could do that, but you could set it up as a DR site with bi-directional failover, and then look at this, you could restore back to SQL Server 2022 for dev test or fail back. Now we're not ready to show you the fail back part today, it's coming. Even the private preview program, we're not ready necessarily to even show you that, but we will. I mean, by the time we release all this software, that's what we're going to support. And then the fact that the DR site that you're using is fully managed. So again, the scenario might be my SQL server is down, just like DAGs, I could then fail over to that DR site, right? I would 
perhaps even necessary, I could try to synchronize if that's possible, could be forced, maybe I have some data loss I'm gonna achieve. I then use that as my primary, redirecting my app necessarily that. Then I get my SQL Server back up running, I sync that back, now as my secondary, and then I fail back, just like you might do today with SQL Server. But note, and you're gonna see in the demo, because managed instance is gonna have a flavor of this where it becomes versioned. So it becomes compatible with SQL 2022, you could actually, once, you, once you'd set this up, you could take a back copy only backup from MI and go restore that to another SQL 2022 for dev test purposes. Yeah, you have a question. Yeah, and does that work through future build numbers? Yeah, so the question is going to be, how does that work with future build numbers? We'll, we'll show you how that works. The intention is to keep track of major versions of SQL Server, cumulative updates, whatever we need to, and make sure we keep all that synchronized. Okay, but remember though, just to be clear, previous version, our intention is previous versions of SQL Server, that'll be used for the migration discussion or read-only scale. This will be used for disaster recovery. And even though I think I've told you, I've always told you this, guys, licensing, pricing, additions, we don't announce those kind of type things. One of the things we're thinking about is how do we potentially make that license-free when it's passive, like when you don't use it? Just like today, if you did that in Azure VM, you would make it that way, right? You may have seen that. You could set up an Azure VM as a secondary replica, and if you designate, I'm not going to touch this, just use it for DR, you don't pay for the SQL licensing for that. We announced that at the 19 time frame. Let me, if you don't mind, I'll address those at the end when we get there, okay? Okay, so what do you get in managed instance? You get automatic redundancy. That could be a business critical, by the way, service tier if you want, in the background, right? Uh, but you get built-in redundancy already for your storage, for your databases, built-in HA, automatic backups, automated updates, private virtual network, you get all of that because you're in this managed service now. So what customers have told me is that they do SQL servers this way for disaster recovery, but then they struggle with all that stuff on the right-hand side. But now since MI provides that, that's one of the reasons why we chose to go down this path to provide this functionality. All right, let's see what it looks like in action. So again, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. I recorded all of this uh, because some of it's time-lapse based, right? But I want to walk you through, and I'm happy to pause at some point to show you a few things. So if you saw this in the keynote, I have Management Studio connected to like a private CTP of SQL Server 2022. I took wide roll importers and I restored it in there. And I connected to my managed instance that I have deployed that's gonna become this failover partner. Now I chose specifically, if you'll see here on the, on the, in the T-SQL screen, I chose specifically to show you updatability and version. But first I'm gonna go through this wizard. Now let me pause and just say this for a second. What I'm going to show you is the wizard, and the wizard may change a little bit. This is the preview version of what we're trying to put in SSMS. But I'm also going to show you when I'm done the T-SQL that powers this. You could actually, at the very end of this, do a generate script like you do in MSSMS, and it will show you everything we're doing behind the scenes to make this possible. Which means you don't have to use a GUI to make this. You could automate these things through you know, T-SQL, and as it turns out, you'll see like a PowerShell commandlet to make it work. So I'm going to go through the process of saying, hey, I'd like wired rule importers to be part of replicating this to managed instance. And again, if you're automating this, you'll have the ability to sign in with Azure through normal automated methods like you might use today. I'm picking here the resource group and the managed instance, and I'm going to actually log in and give credentials for that. And that's what we're trying to also figure out during the preview is that you, know, you may not want that to be a SQL credential. Maybe it's an AAD credential that you want to provide, but you need to make it without a GUI. So that's the kind of type thing that we worked through previews to figure out how do we automate those things, right? So this is me giving it a SQL admin account to connect to the MI. That's what the account is for this purpose right here. So I'm basically telling SQL Server locally, how do I connect to this thing? Now let me pause here. What you're doing now, and again, I'm still debating with the team whether you need to supply all this stuff. But this, some of this may look familiar to you. We're really effectively using, again, built-in AGs. So this is the mirroring endpoint that you use with AGs today. We're using the mirroring endpoint on both sides to connect. And down here, there's an option to name the availability group. I don't happen to have one on my system, but we intend to support if you've got an AG, we would just pick, oh, pick the AG that you have on your system today to make part of this, right? So I'm going to go do this. I'm picking those options. I'm just going to say, keep the default name that you have now. And I'll tell you, uh, in Canon, I, I'm picking an AG and making an AG without a replica. You're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Turns out there's a way to actually do that in T-SQL. So this is a wizard, but behind the screen, behind the, the, the scenes, I'll show you the script that makes this all possible. So when this works, I'm showing you a connection to the local SQL server that it's read-write, this is the primary, and the database version. The database version will become key to make this all compatible. 
Then I'm showing you now in Object Explorer behind the scenes, we have an AG and a DAG already for us in our system. And because I've set this up, it's starting to get synchronized. Now in the portal, you can see I've got a database here that's online. Here's the problem that customers have struggled with this. It says online, but it actually in this particular case could be readable, but if we make this eventually like a passive scenario, we don't want it to be readable, right? So online, what does that really mean? You can't tell from here it's read only just by online. It's something I want to work out with the team. To, I want that to say online read only. In fact, it doesn't even say read only in SSMS. You have to go do a property to see it, which I'll show you in a second what that looks like. So I know the database is up there in MI, and I'll flip back to SSMS, and I'll run the same query. I'm in SSMS connected now to the MI, the other node, and you see now, here's the MI URL, and here's the fact that it's read only, and here's the database version. That makes it compatible for me to back up if I want to at this point and restore it to a different SQL server or a different name. I'm just going through SSMS to show you the fact that I've got all the normal tables that I use, et cetera. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that, st I, you know, I love building off uh, wide, wide rule importers because it's so very easy to use something that's existing. But here's the script behind the scene. This is the script today in preview. It automatically helps me create certificates that I need to make this possible. And then notice this um, right here, cluster type none. <laughs> this is the ability we put actually an AG technology to set up an AG without a failover cluster. We actually built this originally in the Linux time frame. But, so this is an AG with no cluster type, which allows me to go in and create a distributed availability group on top of that with my managed instance. And notice in this particular case, it's asynchronous, which makes sense for a DAG scenario. And you see the listener endpoints are the local mirroring point and actually a remote mirroring point on the managed instance itself. So we need to work out and work through for you how you secure all that, right? How do you make sure these ports are all secure? Notice the PowerShell command. So behind the scenes, there's this new PowerShell command that MI guys wrote to make this together. This is really powerful. We're using the built-in seeding that comes with AGs. If you've not seen seeding before, we use the actual mirroring endpoint to stream information from your database, almost like a VDI backup. And that's a powerful thing that got launched with SQL 16. This is the normal dashboard that you see in AGs on your SQL server, and I'm showing you they work and they exist because, again, we're just using the built-in capabilities of AGs and DAGs that exist in the engine. What we've done is instrument and provide new capabilities in managed instance to understand that technology and make it link together with MI. So, you know, you saw this in the keynote demo. I'm creating a table, and I'm creating another table. Um, you know, I'm sorry, I'm a Texas guy, right? So I'm just showing you vehicles and cargo, kind of off the WWI theme, and what city they exist in. And I just pick a random set of types of stock items to go in there. <clears throat> and of course, my hope is that when I run this, I can easily go into managed instance and run an aggregation to see vehicles by cargo. So I'm building this demo, and I thought, well, that's all really lovely, Bob. That's great for a keynote. But can this thing really, you know, can you pop it up a little bit? Can you actually run a bunch of users doing this, that script that I showed you? So I, I decide to, you know, I'm showing you refreshing managed in, uh, the managed instance side, that here are the tables that I built, and they exist there. Uh, but what I thought is, could I run a multi-user workload on the SQL side, and how quick would I see the results on the managed instance side? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop up OStress, and I don't push it too hard yet, but I thought, you know, it'd be kind of cool. So I don't know. Let me push up OStress here and see what it looks like. So I'm just going to sit here and run this thing uh, against the server. I actually pick one user in this case, actually, but I've done it with like 25 users. And, it, and it's running that, uh, the, a series of commands to drop the table, recreate it, and insert data. So I'm just popping refresh, and you can see sometimes the table doesn't even exist. So I'm just going to give you an idea here that it is really, quite frankly, even though it's asynchronous in this case. And I'm, I actually, uh, the SQL client is in Azure in all honesty, but it's in a different region. It's not even the region of where MI exists. So what's the failover look like? So I go to the wizard. Again, this can be automated because this is just a wizard that's using T-SQL behind the scenes. This is me uh, connecting with AAD. This is always an adventure at Microsoft, by the way, to do these demos because we have very restric restrictions on how we do things. Uh, when we do active or directory uh, sign-ins. Let me pause it and tell you here, this is an asynchronous process, right? This is an auto failover. We can't do that. So, and you don't want to do that, right? Because this could be a fairly you know, distributed location, just like a DAG would be. So I either have planned or forced. And if you look at our documentation, this is exactly what an async replica looks like for AGs. 
A planned is you try to synchronize your workload and your data as much as you can. A force being, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I'm just going to have to access, accept possible data loss and just allow it to go through. So we'll show you behind the scenes a script on how we do the plan, because we actually try to go, if you've ever seen logging, you know about log sequence numbers, we're going to try to compare LSNs between SQL Server and MI to make sure that they're in sync to make that work. So I go through a process of confirming that I think my workload is quiescent, and I'd like to plan it so we can get synchronized with no data loss. Now here, this is an interesting one. So somebody asked me, like, why would you want to delete these if you're failing back? You wouldn't <laughs> if you're failing back. So I got to think about the user experience here. Like, what do we do to say, hey, if I've chosen the fact that I want this to be bi-directional, don't even allow me to go do this. You can actually delete just the DAG part, by the way, in case you're wondering, like, do I need to clean up my existing AG? No. You could just delete the DAG part and leave your existing AG. Or in this case, I picked to delete my existing AG, which, you know, deletes both of them. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and say just delete here just to clean up the resources, because I like to repeat this over and over. And this is a sequence that is actually scripted. And this is us trying to make this switch to asynchronous, to, excuse me, synchronous mode for the AG. And then going through, and at least right now, it's like a three pass operation. I'm going to try several times to see whether I'm synchronized, and then I might give up at that point. But we still haven't decided like how many retries or how should we configure that. So I'm going to use T-SQL to alter the availability group here. Notice it to become synchronous. And then I'm going to use a PowerShell commandlet that the MI team has provided to go into MI and say, hey, I'd like to sync this up between your SQL server. So again, we're using built-in technology from SQL server, but the MIT's provided technology on their side to make this possible. Here are queries that we're actually running the, behind the scenes to see, are you synced up? using hardened LSNs on both sides, because those DMVs are built into SQL to see what is my latest LSN that I've hardened on my log on both sides. So once that's possible, I can say, great, I'm synchronized. I then, behind the scenes, you a PowerShell command to say, oh, great, I think I'm good. And then if I decide to do cleanup, I would just use existing T-SQL to drop these. <coughs> and then. Of course, at this point, because I've done a failover, I've said, hey, I had a problem with SQL. I want to use that as my primary. I should be able just to connect to MI. I should see that the AG is gone, because I cleaned it up. I can connect to MI itself, and I should see now it's read-write. Still that same version. Now that becomes my primary. What's missing, of course, from this equation is, Bob, what's the experience to fail back? And that's what we're going to show you coming up in the future. So that's a little bit look of what we're doing to MI behind the scenes. Again, a combination of built-in engine features and some enhancements in MI to make all this possible. You did have some questions, so let's stop and do that real quick. When you're running primary in um, Azure, yes. and you're replicating back, one assumes that you can't use a data regress? The question is, is that if I'm running primary managed instance and I'm going back to SQL Server, is that Azure egress? I don't sure yet. I don't think we've decided exactly how would we charge you during this process of connecting this together. So I don't have an answer yet on how we're going to charge in that scenario. Yes. Sorry, that light's pretty bright. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, is that if the SQL server is like not available, totally down, not, not accessible, can I fail over still? And that's that forced failover scenario. That's no different than what you would do today with SQL Server. Like if you had a distributed availability group today or an async replica today, have you ever, if you've ever seen that, you have an option to say, hey, man, I can't even access the primary SQL server. Just fail over and do it in an async mode. So you can do it, but you could have some data loss, obviously, because you, you couldn't synchronize them. So, OK, let's move on and talk about the Synapse link. You'll find that technology also a little bit interesting. So I said this in the keynote, right? I said that the, the reason we did it was customers tell us, they told us this, they like Synapse as a technology. They want to try to take some of their analytic workloads and move it off of SQL server. I realized today you can use column store. There's a lot of different things we've talked about. You could be using actually the previous feature, right? You could use read-only workloads in managed instance to do this. But what about Synapse? Can I do this actually in Synapse? So without ETL, is it possible? And, and I know that we've completely confused you because what do we have? We have transaction replication, change data capture. I probably missed a bunch of other stuff we do. We have all these things where we're looking at the log, including availability groups, and we're taking changes and doing something with them. So in order to make this successful, though, and you'll see in this diagram in a second, we realized that we needed to do something else that's similar to those, but in the engine, 
baked into the engine, but understands how to talk to Synapse. Like, what do you mean, Bob? What the heck? How do you talk to Synapse? We'll see you in a second. Because the thought was is that could we reduce the need for ETL, which I think people can do that today, obviously, right? Azure Data Factory, they could even do scheduled jobs. Maybe you could do a scheduled job to snapshot stuff, but none of it is based on incremental changes. That's the key to this model. Seed some data with Synapse into the Synapse pool system. And to make sure I'm very clear about this, this is different than Cosmos DB Link, because Cosmos DB Link, which is a great technology, relies on Synapse to query Cosmos still. The data doesn't sit in Synapse. We are actually replicating data and sending changes directly into the SQL pools in the Synapse system itself. So therefore, you could take advantage of the full scalability uh, that you have in Synapse itself. Or as we talked about here, you know, if you're a Synapse person now, you can just go nuts. You can combine it with everything you do in the Synapse system. We've done some demonstrations where we've actually combined it with IoT data in this example and run like machine learning models inside Synapse on this uh, scenario. Or then if you're Patrick LeBanc, of course, you can be very creative with Power BI reporting. Obviously, according to Buck, I don't know how to do that, but I'm going to prove to you I can. Not like Patrick, though. Okay, so again, this is a little bit preview because we might, we might you know, change the architecture a little bit here, but there's some key pieces of what we do. What is behind the scenes going on? So the dash lines are the Synapse workspace, right? Uh, and inside there are those SQL pools, which are normally part of Synapse, and you will actually deploy that yourself. You'll deploy a Synapse workspace, You'll, you'll actually go say, hey, I want a SQL pool. You'll pick a certain, what's called a power level, DW level of those pools. What's inside there, though, because of the fact you're going to use this feature, is we have something called an ingestion engine, which is going to be able to read from something called a buffer area or landing zone. This is Azure, st well, actually, sorry, the buffer, the buffer area right here that you're seeing is in Azure. I think I've got a gray dash line. That's not really nice. That's not very readable. There's a gray dash line over there on the left side of the buffer area. So that's Azure Storage, also called a landing zone, currently in the preview experience. And you're asking yourself, like, why do you need Azure Storage? Well, turns out, if you're going to go look at transaction log records, Synapse goes, I don't know what the heck that is. You could use T-SQL to do, like, inserts, but that might not be very efficient. So what we're going to do is we're going to go read from the log in the engine itself, and we're going to know how to talk to this landing zone. Sure, there's going to be proxies, all that kind of type thing you may need to use to make that work. But we're going to talk to Azure Storage, and we're going to put them in a format that Azure Storage understands, excuse me, that, that Synapse understands, and that SQL can put it in a format that's efficient for seeding and for incremental changes. Now, the other thing we're going to do, though, Azure Data Factory is baked into Synapse, and there's a piece of software called the Self-Hosted Integration Runtime. Maybe you've seen this before. It's a lightweight client agent that can sit anywhere on your network that knows how to talk to a SQL server. And what we're going to use it for is a controlling mechanism because it understands how to talk to Synapse and send a SQL server, T-SQL, to light all this up. And I'll show you behind the scenes. I did a profiler trace. I love using you know, tracing mechanism and extended events because I can go reverse engineer what our, our team is doing. So this is what we're doing architecturally to make this all work. The initial export, we have the ability, we believe, to capture a snapshot while not blocking anybody to make this work. And then we're going to harvest log changes in transactionally consistent batches. So you get consistency when you see this data in the cloud. So would you be delayed in seeing some data? Yeah, maybe if you had not committed uh, those changes. And then I call it near real-time latency because we do use this intermediate buffer area. And we do support something called a polling interval and even a set of workers to make this happen inside SQL Server. So right today, you cannot configure these last two things, but those are the kind of knobs we're thinking about. What would you need to make this faster, less, more efficient, et cetera? So polling in was a good example, like how many seconds should we wait before we submit changes up into Synapse? Uh, you have a question. The question is, is that, is the buffer, so I'm sorry, I, I did a bad job. There's a gray dash line on the left of the buffer area. That's Azure blob storage. It's an Azure data lake. So it's just a storage facility. The agents and all the software agents all are built into the engine. They sit inside SQL Server. The only piece of agent software is this hosted runtime piece. It's a client program that's installed on your network or on your server. And is it like a log reader agent? So the question is, is it like a log reader agent? The answer to that is no. Log reader agent runs inside agent. The things we're doing are in the engine, like change data capture type stuff, right? Although. You know, CDC, you publish these tables and you read from them. We're automatically taking changes in a set of workers, background threads, and we're feeding it into the landing zone directly. Okay. 
By the way, uh, I'm an architecture guy. You guys know if you've seen some of my stuff, right? Like, I'm going to really dive a lot more into this, but I didn't want to do it today or later because we might change it a little bit. So, like, showing you, like, the actual, going into SQL and showing you the background workers, I'm not ready to do that because if we change it, then it's like, oh, Bob, you, you told us there were five of these and they were called this in their weight type, and then all of a sudden, you know, it changed on us, right? So, okay, so let's take a look at it. So, you saw maybe in the keynote a few things I'm going to expand on. What I didn't show you is I have a workspace. I built this, right? I built that Synapse workspace, <clears throat> and I built a dedicated pool. And I just picked the default uh, scalability and size of that pool. Now, notice here I have a dedicated SQL endpoint. I can use that to actually connect if I want to for Management Studio. In this case, I'm going to my local SQL server, and I'm showing you the data I have locally. I, I've not gone into Synapse and set this up yet. I've not done the setup process. As it turns out, again, just like anything else, we're going to automate this. Let me pause for a second. We're going to automate this for you, but I'm showing you the user experience. And what you're going to find is this. You're going to, we're just showing you SQL locally here now to see what the setup looks like. But I'm going to drive the car, I'm going to drive this whole thing from Synapse Studio. And you're like, I'm not a Synapse Studio person. <laughs> That's okay, because we're going to give you automation if you'd like to be able to drive this from a SQL type perspective or a PowerShell type perspective. But we're showing you user experience now. Okay, so here we go. I got my local SQL server. I'm showing you, and you know, I'm pretty lazy, so I'm gonna build the same demo that I did for managed instance. I'm gonna take wide rule importers and I'm gonna take the same tables that I use in that MI demo. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna take these uh, vehicles and, and just insert this data. And then I'm gonna go over inside Synapse now, and here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to show you the fact that I've got this. I have a built-in serverless pool. We're not ready to work yet with serverless. This works only with dedicated pools today. But I've got this dedicated SQL pool I built in Synapse. And so here's the steps I need to follow. Let me stop for a second. The steps today are this. You need to build what's called a link service. Think of it like a link server. You need to go into Synapse. And you say, hey, I've got a Synapse pool. I've got my Synapse workspace. What's the name of the SQL server to connect this to? How do I th authenticate to this? And then you're going to see I'm going to need to set up what this is called the self-hosted runtime piece. I get to do all that from the Synapse Studio, though. It's going to tell me, hey, here's the runtime piece you need to use. Here's the software you've got to install. Here's a key you've got to use when you install it. Now, I'm not going to show you the install of that. That's not all that exciting. But I'm driving the experience from Synapse. So first thing I'm going to do is set up what's called a link service. Today, you won't see that unless you're in the private preview program to do it for SQL Server, okay? And you're probably wondering and you're asking yourself, like, Bob, are you consistent? Will you do this in Azure SQL? And the answer is yes, we will. <laughs> you just haven't seen it yet. So, okay. So here we go. We do the link service. I've created it. So I've, I've linked my SQL Server to Synapse. And we'll talk about the landing zone in a second. That's the piece that's that buffer area we talked about. And that's Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 today. So I create this link service all in Synapse. And then, let me pause. Okay, so I, 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 you're like, Bob, you're shortcutting too much. I'm sorry, it's not all that exciting to show you going through some dialog boxes to say, this is the name of the SQL server, this is the authentication, and here's that self-hosted runtime. I will flip back in a second, though, to show you the self-hosted runtime, the little GUI of what it looks like when you run it on a client. But over here, if you look at this, once I set up the link service, I need to set up a link connection. Well, that's really confusing. So the service is, again, like a link server. The connection is for you to tell us, based on the database you declared in your, in your service, what tables do you want? So you see the difference? Service is just like a connection. The, uh, sorry, the service is just like a connection for like what SQL server? And I can't be more confusing. The link connection is what tables am I going to seed and, and track for changes? So you see over here, I'm going to pick all the tables from WWI to set up. And remember, I had my vehicle and count table already set up in SQL Server on my, on my um, source SQL Server. So let me let this play for a bit, because I'm going to show you in a second. So I've selected that already. I've already gone through the process of picking those tables. Uh, just wait, so one other comment. You can decide the name of the target table in Synapse, because again, it's like a SQL Server, right? It's tables. You can actually change the name of those target tables to be whatever you want. And notice here, I actually have a clustered column store indexes already built on top of those tables. So I just pick one for one, the schema and the table name being the same in both systems to make it simpler to show it to you. So with this link connection, I go through the process of checking off which source tables I want. 
I, got a, I actually met with a customer this morning. They asked me, well, that's really lovely. Can I add after this? And you can. So you can create a set of tables. You can go back afterwards and drop some tables if you want to drop it from the system. Haven't decided yet whether you probably have to manually drop the pool table. Probably we would make you do that because I don't know if I want to make you. Maybe we'll offer an option, drop both or something, right? But you can drop tables if you want, or you can add additional tables after the fact. So if you made a mistake and said, well, these are the three tables I want to start with, and then later I want to add five more, you can do all that. So here's the SQL server I've linked up. The target database is the SQL pool that I've set. I know it says the word SQL database, another confusing point, but that actually turns out is not a SQL, Azure SQL database. That's the SQL pool database in Synapse. Okay, let's stop for a second and talk about the landing zone. Because that was a good question you asked earlier, right? So the landing zone is on the right side of the gray line. It's in Azure. It's Azure Data Lake Storage. Today, in SQL Server, you are going to control that yourself. You provision the Azure Storage. We tell you how to do it. You create a container. If you've never done that before in Azure Storage, that's OK. It's a folder. Think of it like that, like a, like a local drive in the blob storage. So here, I've got the landing zone, which is my Azure blob storage account. So I told early what that are. You have to actually create some credentials for it. You do that in the process of creating it. And then you create a container that you want us to store the files. That's the key to this system. We're going to take a series of data that we harvest from SQL Server, and we're going to put it in forms of Parquet and other files to store seeding and for incremental changes. Just real quick, just on, I'm just on, on moderation, just so I know, because I'm so brain dead. Like, when do I, how much more time do I get? It's 3.40. 14 minutes. 14 minutes, look at that. That's not bad. I think I can do that. It's a good thing I picked to only show you the demos and stuff. So I'm so full of hot air, man. <laughs> I should do a 500 level on this at some point, right? All right, so I've got all this set up. The link is actually running in this particular case. Like, what you do is when you set this connection up, you say start. I'd like to go connect and make it actually work. So I'm starting the actual connection. And notice it's called replicating. So what's happening now is that I'm seeding the data from SQL Server into that storage area. Okay. Now, one question I got this morning, and I'll show you the storage in a second, is that can I go look at the storage area? I'll show you you can. The question's going to be, can you do something with it? <laughs> Hold on just one second. Let me, let me go through another couple points here. So this is a self-hosted runtime on my client. So this is on the actual local server. But to, to be clear, you can set up this client agent, lightweight agent, on anywhere in your network that can talk to your local SQL server. Here are the SQL commands it's running. Do you see, you see the word Azure Data Movement? In your profiler trace, that's the name of the program. So the self-hosted runtime is called Azure Data Movement to SQL Server. It's just a client. It's like a TDS client running those stored procedures in the local SQL Server to enable the linking to Synapse. And if you look here, can you see the destination? Here's like the landing zone. So SQL Server now knows how to talk to Azure Blob Storage. Well, guess what? We've always known how to do that. You can do backup blobs all day long, right? SQL has the code. It knows how to talk to Azure Blob Storage. So I basically, I'm at, this, is what, this is what the hosted runtime is doing when I started the link connection. And here, it's enabling a table. And it has certain IDs that it uses, which is interesting, but it has names. Here's the name of the table I'm actually using inside Worldwide Importers. So the point to you is, is that even though the hosted runtime is a client agent, it actually uses stored procedures that are built into the engine to make all this work. So you, therefore, could do this yourself with T-SQL. You wouldn't have to use necessarily that agent to make some of this happen. This is an actual uh, catalog view. Let me back up for a second. We're still kind of working on this one piece a little bit. This is a catalog view in SQL Server that shows you which tables have an I able for change feed. It's just like a schema to say, oh, I don't know which ones I set up in Synapse, but I'd like to go to SQL to see what I've done. And it uses this GUID for to show you what that actually looks like. But notice it's got an object ID in there. So you can take the object ID in that table and join it back and find out what table is this really in SQL. OK, do you see the public IP address? That's the VM where I'm running this in Azure for the SQL Server client with the runtime agent. So I'm just showing you in the landing zone, I can prove that I'm linked together by going to something called a node and looking at the IP address. And it's the same as that VM. That would be the IP address of your proxy or your actual agent machine that you have on your network that's using SQL Server. So it doesn't have to be the SQL Server. It could, again, be a proxy itself or another machine on your net. OK, so we talked about the storage account. Here's a look at the container. 
I'm going to go into the tables container because I've just synchronized. And these different IDs are the GUIDs in the DMVs I showed you, right? They line up with those IDs. So in there, you can see it's a parquet file. Parquet files are a common format. That's what we're using today, at least in our design, to seed your data. And then you're going to see when you're going to run changes later, we're going to have a different part of that container, a different set of, of folders that hold the incremental changes. We have not decided if we're going to publish that protocol. Like, what does the incremental changes actually look like? So here I go. I'm running a query against the SQL pool itself to see what it actually looks like. And this is a standard that you can do in Synapse. You can just run queries if you want to, right? This is just showing, oh, I have one file. And unlike what Buck Woody and Patrick LeBont think, I can do more than charting. I think I do this right here. Yay, I got a Power BI report with the state of Texas. The lovely state. I miss the state of Texas. It's snowing today in the state of Texas. How crazy is that, right? That's what my wife told me. So those are very cities in the big state of Texas here. And the dots just indicate how much stock, how much cargo is in each vehicle. I just created a simple Power BI report to show that. So now I'm running a command in the local SQL server to add more cargo to all those vehicles in some random way. Not each city and each vehicle have the same set. So how near real time is this? So it actually was pretty quick for me to first, I'm just showing you the fact that the change feed tables show this stock item. This is more of the metadata I'm talking about. And that ID, by the way, lines up with the ID in the storage container. So you're like, how do I map up which folder in that container goes with which table? I'm going to go into that specific one, and I'm going to see tables, and I'm going to go to the, its GUID. i show you that's the GUID that I found inside the DMV in SQL. And now it looks different. Notice you have something else like change data. So change data is like a CSV file, which is hold incremental versions of the changes I made in SQL Server. Doesn't mean we'll always use CSV files. I'm just showing you behind the scenes. We're using actual file structures to host information in that buffer area to ingest this inside the Synapse because Synapse knows how to go read those formats. And then I'm just showing you a chart here of that data because that's what I showed in the keynote because apparently I'm not a very visual person. Uh, but I do have a Power BI report, and I can refresh it pretty quickly, and I can see the changes. So while that's coming up, uh, you have a question. Yeah, is there any reason why you use the CSV files to change your parquet? Just, I don't know exactly the answer to that. The question is online. Why do we use CSV and not parquet for the changes? I haven't talked to the team why they do that. And don't count on that as being the final thing we're doing. I'm just showing you in the container the difference between we have the seeded data and the change data. And again, we don't even know if we're going to publish the format of that. Like, can you get in the middle of this? and do something with that data. We're still kind of deciding how would we do it, and if we published it for you, would we break you, <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. So maybe we don't use CSV in the end, I'm not sure. OK, so that's Synapse Link. You kind of see behind the scenes the power of what we're putting together. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't answer your question earlier. Go ahead. Um, so the question is, is about do I have problems with certain types of data in Parquet files? Is that what your question is? Oh, I have certain types of problems with column names. It's a great question. I don't know the answer to that question. There are some limitations today in the preview of what we're doing in Synapse regarding some data types. I haven't seen any limits with column names necessarily. But Got you. The question is, is that if I have like a space in my column name, will Parquet take that? I don't know the answer to that question. I have to talk to you afterwards to see. I'd like to know more about what that is, by the way. To, to find out if that's a limitation. So you get a feel behind the scenes of what we're doing with Synapse. And to finish off, let's talk about purview, but let's jump ahead so we can finish this off with a demo. Because what Evangeline showed you and talked about was great stuff, lineage, policy management. The policy demo she did was with what? Azure Storage. Did you all see that? How about a demo that you've not seen before with SQL Database, which will eventually work with SQL Server? So RG Ward, I don't know who that guy is, this guy out there doesn't have rights to this SQL Server, uh, which is using Azure Database. Again, this is going to work with SQL Server 2022. If you click it and you try to connect, he has no rights to this thing. <clears throat> and you see he's got an error when he tries to connect. What I'd like to do is I'd like to give RG Ward rights to be a performance monitor at my organization across three servers that I have. Okay? So I've set up a policy in Purview to do that with two servers, one called Purview, Purview 1 and Purview 2. So I'll go in, and I just declare this. I don't have to do anything else. Just say, and I pick, oh, it's Bob. <laughs> it's Bob's alias, I guess, RG Ward. So I pick Bob, and that's in my Azure Active Directory as a different account, not Bob Ward at Microsoft.com. 
So I'm going to give Bob rights to do this by picking him and then saving this and publishing it. When I publish this, you're going to see I can now go into SQL Server and all of a sudden he can log in. He has rights to log in that he didn't have before. So he goes in and he connects and now all of a sudden he can log in and you'll see when he logs in, all of a sudden now you see at the top he's logged in with his Active Directory account, even though I didn't create a login for him. Huh? So we have something called policies now, which the engine understands that don't require logins necessarily to give somebody access to SQL Server. And what we're doing from a perspective of performance monitoring is we're giving this person explicit rights to do certain things. You're going to see here that he can't change, for example, the configuration of a database. He doesn't have rights to do that. But what he has rights to do is run DMV queries against stuff to do what? Performance monitoring. So we are deciding what types of metadata would somebody need to do performance monitoring, like DMVs, like catalog views, and we'll just give them rights to do that. So the other thing I wanted to do, though, is I wanted this to work across servers, right, just automatically. So I can go to the second server and do that, and Bob now can connect to that, and he can run the same queries as he did before. Four minutes? That's why I watch this. <laughs> Is there four minutes left? We're hanging on a cliff here to decide if it's going to end in four minutes, right? So the other thing I want to do, though, is I would like to, at this point, decide I want a third server. Like, I did two of them. Can I do three of them? So this is just showing you the fact that Bob has the same access rights as he did before. Again, no logins are required here. In fact, I think what I show you is I'm going to go connect as an admin, an actual admin, against a SQL server. Yeah, this is an admin, and showing you, though, there's no login for rgwarda outlook.com. And in fact, if you go in there and see it, you're like, there's not even, Bob's not even listed as a user in the database. So we're not bypassing, we're just having a new system inside the SQL engine that allows policies to be used for authentication and access. And you see here, I'm running this query to show you the database principles. He doesn't exist here, but notice the new DMVs. I see policy roles and policy role members to see the fact that Bob, rgwarda.alec.com, is a member. Well, how do I know he's a member? Let's run it and see what happens. Well, there's no rgwarda.alec.com there. There's just some sort of ID down there, principal AAD object ID. We're always really famous for doing this, right? <laughs> so what do you got to do? You go into your Azure Active Directory, at least today you see that. You can go into your AAD, take that ID, and you can see it lines up with the ID in AAD. So like any other system, we have GUIDs. AAD has an ID system. That ID is the same one in AAD that we actually store in SQL Server. So when rgoutlook.com logs into SQL, we look for his AAD ID and see does he have permission to actually do that. So I can go through and add a third server. How do I do that? I go and say, oh, I'd like to add a third server to do the same thing. Performance monitoring, I go in and say, oh, OK. Let me, in this case, again, it's Azure SQL Server, but SQL Server is also going to support this. Two minutes. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> I go in and pick Outlook.com. Bob, type faster. Hit OK. And you're going to go in and save it, and you're going to publish it. And you're going to see that it can log in. What I'm going to jump ahead and show you, though, because I'll run out of time, is the fact here. I want to remove two of them. So I'm going to go delete him from two of the servers just by going into the policy editor. And when I delete him, I'm going to republish it. And you're going to find out he tries to go back into the servers he had access to, and he can't log in. So I'm showing you the ability to use Purview as a central policy management for authentication and access into SQL Server, also going to be an Azure SQL database. We've announced the SQL Server part of it. Pretty powerful stuff. So um, just to finish off, resources and feedback. I'm so glad that I cut about six slides out of this deck, or we would have never got there. And even though, as it was, it was pretty rushed. So what can you see we're doing? Managed disaster recovery of managed instance, near real-time analytics with Synapse Link, policy management purview. It's on your terms. So you're not required to use this if you install SQL Server 2022. You can pick and choose whichever one you want. And again, we'll discuss with you when we go generally available. What do the licensing look like? What does the subscriptions look like? How do we do those kind of things? Last few questions. Yeah. How does Synapse Link perform under IO 
How does Synapse Links perform under high OTP systems? That's what we're trying to work out in the preview. <laughs> Boy, what a cop out of a question, right? Thank you for time. Yes, sir. We'll just, if you can leave if you need to, but we'll answer the last questions here. Yeah. Have you registered out the users on the object ID? How do you know which users are in your systems? You use those DMVs to figure out what AAED IDs have. And I realize it's difficult to go back to the portal and figure out what was that, right? We need to figure out how to make that programmatic. That's a fair request. Hey, thanks for your time today. I'll stay for further questions if you'd like to. But I'm here the rest of the afternoon or at the booth all day tomorrow. Thanks for your time today.